Good morning, good morning, and good morning. How's everybody today? Blessed and highly flavored. <laughs> Glory. Uh, well, if you didn't get touched, have somebody smack you. <laughs> you know why? Because you missed it. <laughs> You missed it. If you didn't get touched this morning, you missed it. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> you weren't willing to press in and go cross over. Eyes are still on self. Woe is me. Oh, hallelujah. What a beautiful day in God's neighborhood. In his neighborhood, not ours. <laughs> You know, again, I want to, I'm, I'm always going to be probably bringing up the area of the time and season that we're in, which is phenomenal. For us to be alive and to see what's going on globally is phenomenal. To watch the enemy be de exposed. To watch the corruption and destruction of evilness become a reality to finally to many American people that haven't seen it in so long because they've been so sheltered by their own lives, blinded by their own lives, living a life of survival, not surrender, never able to see what's really happening. What a time and season we are in right now, but I can tell you that as we go through this process and conversion and the fire of the body of Christ, as God begins to separate the bride from the body, And in this process, we're entering, we're still in that first and second wind that's still blowing. The first wind is still ripping away and exposing. The second wind is dropping provision, strategy. There's something getting ready to happen tremendously, and we all know it. Something is about to explode tremendously. And I really again, believe that God is preparing His servants those who are followers, not pretenders, those that are sold out, those that are willing to be, not want to be. There's a lot of talk, but no action. Those individuals are going to receive an anointing that's going to be released. It's going to be so powerful. We are entering, why? Because we're being squeezed. Amen? You get Oil out of squeezed olives, right? You get new wine out of squeezed grapes. God is squeezing his body, and he's birthing his bride. And in this, he's going to anoint his bride in such a most powerful way. We're going to go back to more than the beginning of the church. I'm telling you, we're going back more than the beginning of the church. Because the early and the latter rain is going to be mixed anointing. It'll be such a double portion. I truly believe this. That's why we're going through hell. Hello. Jesus went to hell and came back. So you do too. <laughs> But it says when he came out of the temptation, he became stronger. Amen? There was a stronger anointing on him. And I really believe that this is what we're entering. We're getting, it's getting ready. That's why God is just preparing his children. And he's trying to get in position so they don't miss it. But the enemy brings so many distractions. One of the things that comes with the anointing is not only sight, but what we call vision. Vision. You know, vision is more than just the things that we see. One of the things that God wants to bring to me and you is God's vision and remove selfish vision. And that there's a divine order that we walk in. 
See, God can't give someone that's not in the order. Would you turn to Ephesians 4? I believe right now that there's a recapture of your vision going to be manifested here shortly. Now, again, this is not your selfish vision. This is the vision of God. Now, there's a, a foundational vision, amen, where we work in unity in the body. And so many people haven't even fulfilled that. God does not send someone out to fulfill a vision until the vision, the vision that he has established is fulfilled first. Why? Because it's a part of his law called what you sow is what you reap. He doesn't inter he never interrupts himself. Never, never interferes with himself. Hallelujah. Recapture your vision. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Sweet. Very sweet this morning. Hallelujah. You know, uh, for me, I felt like dismantled, totally dismantled. And then just began to put back together again. You know, when he does those things, he increases anointing. The whole thing is allowing him to do it. Don't fight him. <laughs> There's some things I can't even put into words. And verse something. Are you there? <laughs> Ephesians 4.11. <laughs> and he himself gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and what? Teachers. For what? The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is an anointed body. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, that is your connection, forever attached into the heavenlies, right? And the knowledge of the Son of God. So we got a unity of the faith with the connection. The knowledge means the revelation of Jesus as the anointed one, the Christ. The knowledge of the Son of God, meaning that there is a revelation, just like when he said, who did they say to them? Peter got the revelation, you are the Christ. Amen? That is in the knowledge of it. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the presence and power and truth of God Almighty here, right in front of me. Hallelujah. So we all come to the unity, the faith, your connection, and a knowledge, revelation that Jesus is the Christ to a perfect, to a what? Perfect man. That means immovable. Immovable. And how is that going to be established? It says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, to the fullness of the anointing. In other words, the anointing, the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. Now listen, there's something important that we got to grab hold of. Everything's in the anointing. Does everybody get it? Without the anointing, there's nothing. It's nothing but words and religion. Everything is in the anointing. Everything. That's why God himself came into this realm. In him is everything. Everything is in the anointing. Everything. And people have walked away from anointing. The, enemies have the enemy has deceived people. Where the anointing is lifted. Everything is in the anointing. And without the anointing, you and I are nothing. Remember, it starts off with his presence. And his presence releases the power. No presence, no power. And what is the anointing? It is the presence and power and truth of God Almighty. Amen? 
Everything is in the anointing. Everything. That's why Jesus said, if you have me, you have everything. Glory. Let's go a little further. He said this. He said, now that you are you're coming to that place of unity where you're staying connected with the throne, with heaven, the river of life, tree of life, throne of glory, and the knowledge of the revelation that Jesus is, in the, is the Christ and that everything in him is where everything exists. And without him, nothing exists. Till we come to the perfect man where we're immovable. We're not moved no matter what. Because we're held by and living in and abiding in the anointing now. Then he says this, he says in verse 14, that we should no longer be children, immature. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, which we see all over right now. People are deceived big time. Why? No anointing. There are a lot of, I, I don't know how to explain this. There are a lot of antichrists and anti-Christians, now this may sound strange, proclaiming to be in the body. But they're not. And most of them are political. Because they hold seats and positions of authority that are deceiving many people. The media is nothing but the production of a deceptive stage and lying information to keep people away from the truth. They're exploding tremendously, but they're being exposed tremendously. Amen? It says that we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're to be a, uh, no longer children tossed to and fro and being deceived, but we're to, verse 15, we're to be speaking the truth in love that and may grow up in all things into what? Him who is the head, into him who is Christ, abiding in him. Again, I want to emphasize, and the anointing is everything. He is the anointed one. Without, in the anointing, there is nothing. It's temporary. We know that everything is temporary here, but in the anointing, it's eternal. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its what? Does its, every part has a vision. Amen? Doing what? Their share. They see what they're supposed to be doing. Every part. Causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So every part has a vision. That's, there's a foundational vision for each and every one of us. Everyone should desire to see the kingdom of God expand. That's a foundation of vision. Amen? And, and now in this, there's people who have abilities and talents to further the kingdom. So in other words, what God is, your abilities and talents should still be to further the kingdom. Everything should be about furthering the kingdom. If you're not living for furthering the kingdom, then you're living for yourself. Does everybody get this? This is important. I'm telling you, there's going to be a tremendous separation. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to miss what God is doing. Because they're still living in survival mode instead of surrender. They're, listen, if you're not believing this Bible... If you're not believing all of it and choosing what you want out of it, then you're not the bride. You're not the bride. The Bible says forsake not to assemble. Why? So you can maintain the anointing. And don't get me wrong. I know things you have to you do. To, but listen, there should be an, enough thirst and hunger for the presence of God that you don't care about anything else. That nothing is more important to you than his presence. Why? Because he's not only your father. He's not only your God. But he should be your best friend. Nothing else should be more fulfilling than getting into his presence. <laughs> That's why we get together. Amen? 
Were you fulfilled this morning? That fulfillment should last to the next time we get together. As long as you don't give it away. <laughs> Second Timothy 2. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, and glory. And verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. Recapturing your vision. You know, many times people say, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Now, there are certain things that we ask on a daily basis for guidance. Amen? And that we should be. Lord, what do you want me to do today? And one of the things that's always behind it is promote the vision. Promote the vision. Promote the vision. What is the vision? Well, the vision is to expand the kingdom of God. What is your talent and ability? What are you doing? But listen, if it's not backed by the anointing, then you're not promoting it. You're not doing it right. You're going to try and build in your own strength, your own flesh. You're going to try and do all kinds of stuff, and it will never be accounted for. That's where people become successful in the wrong assignment. Because God didn't send them to do that. A lot of businesses folded because God didn't tell them to do it. They did it because it was their selfish vision. Listen, when God fills you with his spirit, you're no longer a man anymore. You're no longer human. I'm telling you again, when God fills you with his spirit, you're no longer human-like. While you speak different, you see different, you're no longer led by how you feel. You're totally taken out of the world, even though you're still in it. That's what he means, being taken out of the world. You don't live by what you see. You live by what he shows you. It's different. And this is where many people have gone astray. Man, you know you can just chase God in your own closet. Hello? <laughs> if people would just spend enough time with him at home, they would be bringing the presence of God together when we all got together. Man, what an anointing! But most of the time, most people only get it when they come together. Hello? But we should all be bringing the presence of God here. Hallelujah. And when we come together, man, there's a strong anointing. The power is released, and you change. Something happens. Somebody gets healed. Some of this, whatever. You get free. Especially emotional healing is important. To me, I believe that that's one of the most destructive part of an individual's where the enemy is tearing people up with torment, bondage, and fear, and anxiety, and guilt, condemnation, and every other thing that the enemy can emotionally destroy you. That's how people get sick most of the time because it first starts with an emotion. Why? Because it says a merry heart is good medicine. Amen? When you're miserable, you get sick. Hallelujah. Glory. Did we read this yet? Verse 1. <laughs> sure got hot in here. Sheesh. Are you ready? Verse 1. You therefore, my son and daughters, be strong in the grace that is the plan that is where? That is where? Oh, snap. So be strong in a plan that is in the what? The anointing. The plan is in the anointing. Everyone say, the plan is in the anointing. Without the anointing, you ain't in the plan. That's enough for today. My goodness. <laughs> 
Alleluia. Verse 2. And these things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to who? Faithful, consistent, sober-minded. Men and women who are able to teach. In other words, they're able to be a witness because they're walking what they're talking. Amen? Verse 3, you therefore must what? Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In other words, that, that hardship is just the attacks of the enemy. It's emotional distresses in the area where you're seeing things. Look at nobody wants to see people be sick. No, I don't want to see nobody be hurt. That's an area where you and I must endure. Welcome to the earth. It's full of sickness, hurt, harm, destruction, and death. Corruption, everything else. But thank God we were pulled out from it. We're above that. Amen? We're blessed with every spiritual blessing seated in heavenly places. You're no longer human. Say, I'm not human. You weren't convincing. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're not human. That was better. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in a warfare. In, are you in warfare? Praise God. Most people are still fighting against themselves. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. <laughs> he says, be strong in the plan that is in the anointing. You know that the plan that's in the anointing is called the perfect will of God? See, when people get entangled in the affairs of this world, they become compromised, distracted. And the enemy knows how to hold them up, hold them off. And then they miss the things God's doing. People miss their healings. They miss their freedom. They miss their deliverance. They miss all kinds of stuff. Because God has a designated, appointed time that you must meet him, not that he meets you. I'm going to say that again. God has a designated time that you meet him not to where he meets you. Everybody okay? No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Why? Because you are fighting for the presence of God in his life, in your life, so that you don't miss him. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What happens then when compromise or complacency begin to come in because the people are so involved in the affairs of this world? They compromise the divine order of God. Things are now out of order, not in divine order. See, now my, things may be seem, seem in order in your own home and stuff, but they are, are they in order in God's and how he sees it, not how you see it. It's how he sees it. Hallelujah. Again, we are divine order. Hallelujah. When, when the divine order is established, it promotes and maintains the anointing. Disorder lifts the anointing. Divine order maintains the anointing. So then when you're in divine order and the anointing is maintained, you're in God's vision and not selfish vision. Acts chapter 9. Glory. Capture, recapture your vision today. You can call it recapturing your vision. And again, there is the basic foundational vision. What is it? To expand the kingdom of God. Then you have your talents and abilities and so forth to participate 
in expanding the kingdom. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, there is a... Um, there is a vision, a foundation, a vision where God places you. There is a house of gathering that he places you, a ministry that he places you. What are you to do? You're to support the vision of that house. If you're not supporting the vision of that house, then you're out of order. That's not a religious thing. That's how people become armor bearers of God. They support the vision of the house they're in. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Everybody there? Let's speak it together. Now, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from them to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, Christians, whether men or women or children, they didn't put that in there, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I want you to look at it because Jesus said, look at it. You're persecuting me, but Saul, how am I persecuting you by persecuting my body? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? <gasps> Finally. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but not seeing anyone. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his, when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight. And neither ate nor drank. Now I want you to know that Saul was on a selfish vision. He was on a selfish journey. It was about him. And he was promoting things that were about him and his family line. So he felt obligated to serve the corruptible family <laughs> that was deceived in religious group. To go out and kill, destroy many homes, families, and take captive as many children and so forth as they could to bring imprisonment that were Christians. And he actually believed he was doing it for God. Because that was what he taught, was been taught. He went through all the training, all the cemetery schools, everything. Seminary schools, you know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, verse 10, now there's a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a what? Vision. Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. You bet he was praying. He never prayed so hard in his life. <laughs> He just realized, dear God, I've been killing and imprisoning all those people that were truly of God. You know, and I really believe that the most devastating part was not that what he did, but that he was so deceived. That was that emotional thing, saying, I can't believe I, I was so deceived. Why didn't I ever? I mean, and it's in the scriptures. I mean, I used to read them and tell everybody about it, but I never saw it myself. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered the Lord and said, man, I've heard many things about this dude. How much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name because before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you in, on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight. In other words, that you may receive the anointing to receive sight. He was giving them a new vision. He was now giving them the vision of God. He was putting them on a journey of a vision for, of God, not a vision of self. And when he had laid hands on them, he said, listen, that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. <laughs> Saul carried the vision of selfishness, even though he believed it was God. The Lord interrupted Saul's vision quest. And turn him upside down, loosing him from selfish vision to a godly vision. He was on now a vision quest from God and in a journey. Why? Because in the anointing, he not only received new sight, but he received a new command. Luke 24. Do you understand that in the anointing is where your commands are released to you? Luke 24. Is everybody okay? Recapturing your vision. Sometimes it's just recapturing your purpose. Like, who am I? Why am I here and where am I going? People get drifted from that. They lose sight of that. In a time right now where there is so much distraction. Amen? All over. There, the atmosphere is wretched out there. It's wretched. It's evil. It's deceptive. It's depressing. And there's an area of irritation and anger and hatred. But in the anointing, none of that can come. You're in peace, joy, and righteousness. If you're not in peace, joy, and righteousness, you just stepped out of the anointing. Hallelujah. Verse 13, Luke 24, 13. It says, now behold, two men, two of them were traveling that same day to the village called Amanus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, remember, Jesus was supposed to have been resurrected that day, and he did. Amen? So people were all talking about it. Was he? Was he? Who, where, is, where is he? We don't know this, that, and whatever. And they were expecting all kinds of things to happen, and these two guys were walking from, from there, and like, man, they were disappointed. They were heavy. Because they were, had their own expectations and visions of what was supposed to happen. Hallelujah. Verse 14. And they talked together all these things which, should ha which had happened. So it was while they conversed and re reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? The one who was named Calpheus answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to him, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we are hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes. And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Us, and, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then they said to them, Oh, 
Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, how slow of heart to believe in all the prophets had spoken. Ought now the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. But they still didn't know who he was yet. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would go on further. But they what? Oh, dear Jesus. They what? They constrained him. Now, how do you constrain God? You convince him. Lord, I want more of you. Please don't leave me. Please. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Please don't leave me. I can't live without you. Please. They constrained him. And the anointing was released. Watch what happens. But they constrained him saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went to stay with them. Now it came to pass... As he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were what? Opened. And they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart firm with us? <laughs> while well, he talked with us on the road, and while well, he opened the scriptures to us, and we still didn't see him, but he didn't allow them to see him. But once... Once they said, please, stay with us. They convinced Jesus. I'm telling you, I have multiple visitations in worship here. And the Lord has showed up and said, I couldn't resist myself. And once he hugged me, I was melted. I was gone. We see two witnesses disappointed according to the selfish vision and expectation. Once the anointed one and his anointing <laughs> is contained, they contain him, or they capture Jesus. <laughs> see, we need to capture Jesus. Lord, I'm going to set a couple traps for you today, okay? <laughs> See, but he knows it all. You can't deceive him. You know, you can't trick him. He just knows it all. It's like, man, what kind of, you know, even when you, oh, Lord, oh, like, oh, never mind. He knows it all. He knows where you're at. He knows what's what. Yeah. Tears don't move God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Everybody okay? We had enough of that. Genesis 32. Hallelujah. Recapturing your vision. Genesis 32. Sorry. You know, when we're when we're praising and worshiping the Lord, man, we're capturing him. <laughs> when your heart is really going after him and you're not distracted, God, I'm hungry. Lord, this has been awesome. Thank you. Poop. If there ain't a heart change, you ain't crossed over. And if you haven't crossed over, you haven't captured them. Verse, uh, verse 22. Genesis 32, 22. Hallelujah. Glory. Now this is a, with Jacob, and everybody remembers Jacob. Jacob and his brother Esau, which had a feud they were about to make up, but Jacob was shaking in his boots. So he decided to send all kinds of goods and stuff to his brother before he met him, thinking he'd soften him up. And uh, 
It says here in verse 22, and, and so Jacob arose that night and took his two wives and his, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the fort of Je uh, Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said to him, let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you what? Bless me. Hmm. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which is overcomer. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So he wrestled with God. Amen. <laughs> now Jacob, again, sent all his goods in, in the human understanding and his vision. He's saying, man, I need to smooth my brother for he kills me because I deceived him from the inheritance. <laughs> Hello. I mean, I've done all of this stuff, even though my mom had convinced me, but, you know. And, and then he sold his birthright to me because I made such good stew. But that was all according to the carnal, the selfish vision. Amen? <laughs> but God, who came in a human shape and wrestled with Jacob, he was a human-shaped being from the eternal realm. He was an extension of God because Jacob constrained him. He said, I ain't letting go. I'm not letting go until you bless me. See, too many people just let go. They give up too easy. They're runners, not fighters. They give up too easy. Let me tell you, if you're closer to the Lord, it's a lot harder to get you to let go. But as the enemy begins to plant corruptible seeds and causes you to begin to drift a little bit, he sees it's easier. You know, it's harder to separate something that's this close compared to this close. Then you can break it. Amen? Hallelujah. So, uh, uh, because he constrained and prevailed, he got blessed. <laughs> he got a new vision quest. Everything was brand new. He got a new journey, a new life. even got a new name. <laughs> you know, the word says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Isaiah 66. Well, pride is always a promoter of selfishness. It's not the God, even though they talk about the vision of God, but they don't fulfill the vision of God. Isaiah 66. In verse 1. Hallelujah. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who's poor. And that doesn't mean financially. Hello? <laughs> all these religious groups. I've taken a vow of poverty. What an idiot. My father came to bring life and life abundantly, not poverty. On him who is poor, poor, humble, and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. You want God to look at you? Here it is. <laughs> who trembles at my word, and who is humble, submissive, not in a survival mode, but in a surrender mode. He says, he who kills a bull is as if he slays man, and he who sacrifices a lamb is as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. 
just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their what? Delusions. And bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that which I do not delight. Psalm 51. Hallelujah. Glory. Psalm 51. You know, in my own relationship with the Lord, I, I've always realized that there's a time and place where there's a visitation and then a distance. And it doesn't mean it's a, a distance, distance. It's an area where that sense of His presence so strong and so wonderful and so rejoicing is not as strong. Because He loves to come and hug and then He loves to back up. And He says, come on after me. Come on after me. But see, so many people just say, oh. The first thing they think, they did something wrong sometimes. And I'm not saying that's not the cause, but. Man, what did I do? Nothing. God loves the famous game that we've been kids, hide and seek. It's his favorite game, I'm telling you. We loved it when we were kids. Amen? Especially when you jumped on and frightened someone. Ah, wah! Oh, you found me. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Isaiah, I mean, Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly with my, from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. M make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. He was desperate for his presence. He knew that without his presence, without the anointing, he was nothing. Amen? <laughs> In 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. today, imparting it in our hearts and minds. And it is preparing us and, and hope to give us a thirst and hunger to hold on for this greater release that is coming. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20-something. Let's see. Oh, happy days. Verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. But you have an anointing and a holy one. Up from the holy one, and you know what? You know all things. Hello. You know all things. What does this pertain? It means you know all things that please God. You know all things that displease God. Amen? You know. You can reason, justify, and candy coat it all you want. <laughs> But you know, 
Amen. In verse 27, he said, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you what is good, what is bad, what is clean, what is unclean, what's holy, unholy, what's lawful, and what's unlawful. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you shall what? You will what? Abide in who? Him. And who is him? The anointing. Does everybody get it? See, you're not going to know all things if you're not abiding in the anointing. Knowing all things, the anointing teaching what is, again, clean and so forth. What does the anointing do? It keeps us also in the area of divine order. Why? Because he wants us to be maintained in that position. He desires me and you to be in that position. See, there are boundaries where people are not sensitive to the boundaries. You may be going to the boundaries. There are certain things that you're doing, but sometimes you're doing it too much. Now it becomes an idol. Does everybody get it? Now it becomes an idol. You know, your job can become an idol. Your spouse, anything can become an idol. Your gym can become an idol. You're the worst idol. We're the worst idol. Amen? You know, if you, if you do the same thing over and over and over enough times, sometimes you'll break it. <laughs> or if you do it over and over and over under the anointing, you're going to expand it. It's different. It's going to come into perfection. Anything that's not promoted by God is promoted by the enemy. I'm going to say it again. Anything that's not promoted by God is promoted by the enemy. So one thing's going to constantly keep you in the anointing, or the other thing's going to get you out of it eventually. You can't serve both. Look at what happened to Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel 15. First Samuel 15. A couple more scriptures. You can go home and eat popcorn and find out if you're an anointing or not. It better be anointed popcorn, man. <laughs> Some of us are going to go make a sweet aroma to the Lord. Cooking some flesh. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 15, verse 16. Then Samuel said to King Saul, be quiet. I'm sure the Holy Spirit has said that to every one of us in this room. Be quiet. <laughs> Then he had to get up to where, shut up. <laughs> if be quiet won't work, shut up usually does. Or else he departs. He backs off and says, forget it. We'll talk another time. And Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. <laughs> After he was told to shut up, basically. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, when you were humble, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? When you were what? Humble. So Samuel said to him, oh, and now the Lord has sent you on a mission. And said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back a, a God, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. And he said, but he even testified against himself. Yes, we took all those things that were supposed to be destroyed. Hello. 
But we changed course. I decided to bring them back for you, Lord, so that we can offer these up to you as a living sacrifice. And Samuel said, as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices is obeying the voice of the Lord. Do you know how many people fall into the place of reason instead of obeying? And they wonder why the anointing lifts. Let me tell you, that anointing will lift just like that. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rants. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being anointed as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. In other words, there is a limitation that he no longer anoints. Okay. I will watch you from here. There's a dis long distance relationship. I will watch you from here until there comes a place, and it could be a time process where that humility, humbleness, repentance isn't just once, it's for a period of time until God says, okay. It's like you're knocking at his door. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Day and night, forgive me, forgive me, restore to me. Please, I know I blew it. I made the mistake. I'm sorry. I was wrong. But restore to me. Please restore to me. I can't live without you. Restore to me. You do that enough. You worship enough. You start obeying what this says. He'll restore. Again, when a man is filled with the Spirit, he's no longer a man. He's an extension of heaven. 1 Corinthians 4. Doesn't the Bible say the Father seeks who will worship him in truth and spirit? Amen. So he's a seeker. He's wanting to anoint us as we truly worship him. Oh, hallelujah. Glory, glory, and glory. Verse 1, let's speak it. Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong one. That was good, though. <laughs> Let a man so consider us as what? Servants of the anointing. That's the first thing. Servants of the anointing, in other words, you walk in the power of God to overcome anything that comes against you. You're not a reactor, you're a responder. Some people are nu nuclear reactors. They're ra they let out radiation, man. And <laughs> you say something, whoo! And they get offended like this, and the anointing goes poof, right out the window. Then they reason, justify, and excuse, and blame. Well, you know the anointing's gone then. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Time to get on the potter's wheel. <laughs> Crush. Let a man so consider us as servants to the anointed and stewards of the mysteries of God. Well, where's the mysteries of God coming from? The anointing. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found what? Faithful. Faithful. 
consistent, alert, responsible, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, through three, clean, and reverent. That was this Boy Scout thing. Can you imagine I still remember that thing? <laughs> Anybody ever been a Boy Scout? Anybody ever been a Girl Scout? You were. <laughs> I got thrown out. <laughs> well, it was really stupid of them to put Girl Scouts next to Boy Scouts on a camp meeting, you know? They set us up. So that loyal, friendly, helpful, clean, courteous, kind, and obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, reverent went out the window. Glory. Verse 3. <laughs> but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. In other words, his relationship with the Lord was he didn't judge himself, which means condemn or, you know, consequence in that area. He examined himself. Does everybody get it? See, there's a difference of examining. You examine yourself so you don't fall into judgment. Hello? So what, was, what we want to do is examine whether we're our vision, what we're seeing, what we're doing, and our journey is selfish. Is it from God or is it from self? What's my motive? What's my desire? Hallelujah. Remember, we are stewards of the anointing. I mean, stewards of the mysteries of God and servants to the anointing. And the anointing is everything. Everything. I'm going to close with Psalm 15. Hallelujah. Glory. Recapturing your vision. That means you better recapture the anointing. You got to capture Jesus. Let's speak it together. Psalm 15. Lord, who may abide in your anointing? That's the tabernacle. Verse 2. How, now, he's going to give you the guidelines. There you go. Who walks what? Uprightly. Who works what? Righteousness. Who speaks the truth in his own heart. Doesn't deceive himself. Doesn't lie. He who does not backbite with his tongue. Nor does evil to his neighbor. Nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at usury and he does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved out of the anointing. Amen? Please get ready. Prepare yourself. God always prepares us for what's coming so that we may receive a full reward. Amen? Thank you, Father, for your word. We are honored and blessed. And we ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you'll continue to restore to us your vision for our lives, that we may support and promote your vision for this world in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Prepare your hearts.